Professor Muller, thank you for your presentation. I'm wondering what your perspective is on Argentina and Mali, specifically about being open to the possibility of a free private city or a special economic zone, something along those lines. Okay. Thank you very much for the question. It's very pertinent because this is actually uh, my my idea. Uh, when I heard about uh, Mile getting elected, I was not surprised uh, of what he had had been uh, doing up to now. I mean, he he goes into politics and will be involved in politics, and he has to do this and that against his own proper ideas. So uh, I thought, well, why, why didn't he simply uh, designate an area uh, somewhere in south of Buenos Aires at the border, at, at the sea, at uh, the shore, and open up uh, places for private cities? There are companies in the world that, that, that would be eager to do that. And so he, we, could, we could really do, let's say, in some kind of uh, uh, ironic way, yeah, so uh, Buenos Aires, that's, that's uh, Philip, and uh, the free zone is, is uh, Hans, uh, where both of them can try to uh, develop their ideas. Uh, as far as I can judge it, and uh, I mean, uh, anybody would, would say that I would think so, that when you are in a kind of a situation, be it in Europe or the US or now in Argentina, you cannot start from nothing. You are involved in a whole setup of institutions that have grown for centuries often. And you have the Supreme Court, you have the military, you have your coalition partner. And so uh, politics is a thing of compromises and uh, where, okay, it's a bad business. It's really a bad business in this sense that uh, what's left behind with all of that is uh, are, are the good ideas, is libertarianism, is freedom, is prosperity, because people go into politics, first of all, uh, as power grabbers, uh, they have a desire, and I would say it is the same with uh, Javier Mille, that uh, he, he goes into politics, of course he has some ideas, but he's driven also by the power instinct. Uh, otherwise, you would not go into politics. To have power is a fine kind of, of desire of, of, of dominating, of, of going through and, and be present and be even more uh, present on television. It's also kind of being more popular or, or at least to have a, a, a more audience. So it's an egotistical trip. And uh, one should not be uh, surprised that it's the same with Mile as it is with any other politician to go into politics to show off and to get the power and play the power game. There's also these things that these people like to play the power game. And so to realize if you, if you could hope that he would do something for the libertarian movement, in my view, the best thing would be or could have been that he said, okay, uh, let's try to put up some area, some province, as they are called in, in, in the rest of Argentina, which is uh, outside of Buenos Aires and this uh, northwestern part, very thinly populated, and designate a larger area, not just the city, and open it up for, for companies that, that exist, that, that do these things and uh, uh, so really have a kind of libertarian experiment. And just let's imagine, so you have this thing, political game in the city in Buenos Aires and going on and on. And then you have this other alternative, a little bit like the Chinese did when they had these uh, free trade zones and, 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 and uh, 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 economic free trade zones, where you had an example and they were actually villages 
uh, in, in China at that time. And people move to it. Imagine that people moving out of this crowded uh, province and city of Buenos Aires and moving to this area. What a signal that would be. Let's imagine that even investors flood in. They would build a port where never has been a port. Yes, where there's some kind of business one could not imagine what, what kind, because really it's a little bit off of the whole trade system, but maybe miracles happen in this way. So this was my dream. So when I heard, okay, in December last year that Miele won the election, I did not hope that it would be a great uh, libertarian experiment. So I'm not disappointed of what I hear. I, I'm only a little bit disappointed that he did not pick up this other idea, which is well known. I mean, there are nice books about uh, free trade zones and all these lib free cities, free private cities, and he should know about that. And, but it's, maybe it's not too late. I mean, uh, maybe we can contact him and ask him, and maybe he was asked already, and uh, are, is planning that. It still can be done. That would be great. Yes, hello. Uh, thank you. Um, I have a question um, regarding most of you guys' uh, speeches. Um, it's... Um, it's about immigration as um, as a conspiracy to destroy the West. So it can be related to Millet and why 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 he didn't do as many of the anarcho-capitalist things that he could have done un until now. It regards to why we have uh, this constant propaganda for open borders. It's regarding why. There are the riots in Britain, uh, why uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, real English people are uh, against, I mean, the current and the past governmental uh, policies. Um, so the question is, um, if in your minds, um, open borders and the migration that happened to the West was not simply the consequence of mere stupidity or, or maybe financial greed of some uh, very rich English people or, or Westerners. If it was maybe more than this, um, what in your minds, all of you, do you think uh, are reasonable um, uh, reasons for some el elites to um, have these um, policies in the West that I would say, uh, and it's going to, re uh, I mean, it's, it is very da dangerous to say it, 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 it damages my rep reputation, but I believe that um, immigration in the past and still how it happens today is detrimental to the West. Um, who, I mean, who do you think, which elites with what motives are behind it, if you at all think that there is such a tendency of the elites? <clears throat> may, may I try to to give an answer or what I think about this. I do not believe in any conspiracy, in any planned center or something like that who decides now we are going to conquer the West. I, I do not think that this is, this is real. Um, but, but I think it's just a, a natural phenomenon which um, is driven by states. So, Again, this is our topic, but uh, the, the, that's, that's not by coincidence that we always get to, to this ground of all of many problems. And I think immigration, this kind of, of unpleasant immigration for all participants is uh, very much due to the fact that there is something like states in this world. On the one side, these are states that commit um, that, that make warfare, that warfare, that 
that bomb uh, whole countries to to the ground, that create millions of um, refugees. So, so the the states are causing reasons why these immigrations take place. And on the other side, there are states, Western states, that are silly enough to welcome. Um, as many as possible such refugees, maybe also st so those that are not real refugees, that are just economic uh, m migrants, um, by their social system, that they offer them free housing, free lunch, everything, um, that they do not have to pay, that others have to pay in that country. I think this is the reason. So abolish the state and then you won't have any migration problems anymore. Well, which is somehow simplified, I, I admit, but I never th nevertheless I think that's true. I have no disagreement with, with that point. I just uh, would like to add a slightly different perspective. Um, in the 19th century, I make a remark, that I did at that Coburg conference years ago, you remember. Um, in the 19th century, nationalism was a movement towards centralization of power. I mean, Germany consisted of whatever, 39 different states. Italy was only united in 18... 1861 or something like that, uh, and it always required wars to create the central German state, to create uh, a central Italian state. It was not people uh, came together and said, oh, we are all Italians, we all love each other, and we have now a un unified Italy. Um, nowadays, nationalism is the way to prevent further centralization. The European Union uh, tries to get more and more power, take more and more power away from the national states. How do you do that? How do you overcome national resistance against this centralization that is obviously taking place in Europe? And for that, you have to destroy the homogene homogeneity of the population. Uh, so you import ever more foreigners in there, and that allows you then to reduce the resistance of the Germans against giving more power to Brussels, the resistance of the French to give more power uh, to Br Brussels, the resistance of the Austrians to give more power to Brussels, um, but if if you create some sort of new people who have no relationship to the original country where they now happen to live, then you can centralize power further and further. So the idea is they, they want to create some sort of mongrel population uh, with no, uh, no differences anymore, uh, and that is then the easiest way to rule the population. And one one little comment on uh, on Jeff Dice's speech on immigration. You know, when I wrote these articles in the 19, 1990s, then people thought that I was somewhat crazy that I was not a, a genuine libertarian. I was attacked by all sorts of libertarians. In the meantime, it is only morons who still think that free immigration is is good for the population. Just remember uh, Yayan Pandari's uh, speech. So imagine that we would uh, fill Germany or France or whatever the country is with, yeah, with three, four, five, six, India has plenty of people left over, million people, uh, what, what would that do to Germany? What would that do to France? Uh, libertarians are very often losers um, and people who are secretly egalitarians. They think it makes no difference if there are one 100,000 Somalis 
or 100,000 Austrians, or 100,000 Swiss, or 100,000 Eskimos. Since we are all the same, what's the difference? These people have never, I remember Kaplan, for instance. Um, I know him a little bit. Um, that guy also opposes that people learn foreign languages. He's just, there's no need for foreign language. English is the only language that you need, and then we have machines that can translate. But if you don't know any foreign languages, you don't understand that there are different cultures. It is a ridiculous idea to somehow say, all people are just the same, doesn't make any difference whatsoever. So you, do you destroy the homogeneity with the intention of creating ever more centralized governmental powers. That's my view on, on this subject. Hey Hans, you're not allowed to say Eskimo anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Except at PFS. Uh, yes, we're still on immigration uh, for Jeff Deist. Um, thank you for a great speech, uh, very rousing. Um, <clears throat> I believe that you know the whole notion of immigration by invitation, you know, which is you know Hans's notion, is really central. It's absolutely legitimate. Given that we have states, we have 193 states. Uh, it is possible that they will develop certain. Uh, invitation policies at the state level, not at the individual level. And there is one state that uh, today uh, developed a certain immigration policy, which is uh, that they would take people from the European Union, from NATO, and from five uh, Asian countries with IQ 105, uh, mm. if they agree with the um, <clears throat> sort of values of, well, it's Russia, so the values of Russia. So what do you think, is it like even feasible to have a statewide policy as long as it is extremely restricted uh, in such a way, uh, based on values, origin, or it's hopeless and they're gonna... I mean, it might be possible for a small state that, that is not particularly concerned with global opinion um, it certainly is not possible but for the USA. Russia, right? So. Right. If the USA had an IQ requirement, that would be there would be an enormous outcry. Um, maybe some of the Swiss residents at the conference this week can correct me, but my understanding is that Switzerland allows at least some degree of uh, discretion at the cantonal level about whether immigrants are admitted, and especially citizenship is difficult in Switzerland, much harder than mere residency. And so the decision is not entirely the national Swiss governments to make, that, um, that the canton uh, has at least some say over whether perhaps someone's been a good, good neighbor, uh, you know, not uh, obviously known, not on welfare. Um, so I think everything works better at the smaller scale and that's the tragedy of the 20th century, is that we got big states. Uh, is that, that, David, is it true that the cantons have some sort of autonomy who they admit, or is it a central, uh, central uh, question? Actually, the criterions, they are in principle centralized according to, to federal law, but then the cantons are, um, they are there to execute this, to perform this. And, and as you know, always between general rules and then the, the practical application, there, there can be gaps. And that's why there are always uh, discussions between local or cantonal um, areas on the one side and the federal um, office competent for, for that. But generally, I would also say that as smaller, the smaller some, some, some country or some place is, and the smaller a organization to handle with such problem is the the more natural correctives take place i can imagine and and that's why um, com compar comparable to other countries um, these we have these problems in switzerland of course but they are on a on a lower level as i guess, I guess and not only lower 
just you know proportionally to the smallness of the country, but but also um, more than that. It's 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 a, a smaller problem than in big countries. Um, may I? Uh, sir? Take up on that. Um, I, I used to live in Switzerland, and um, the uh, German-speaking part, uh, especially like the uh, Zug, uh, we have Rahim from Zug, uh, Niedwalden, they were extremely upset that Geneva gives a passport to everybody, anybody who has a pulse. So you know, there could be like a little bit of tension with too much decentralization, but I do not have any answer to anything. Thank you. Um if I could talk around Olivier's question, nations do change over time, and it's a, a platitude, but we do live in an age of unprecedented change. The opportunities for a mixing of peoples, an intermixing of peoples, has never been greater, and a degree of immigration, a degree of new arrivals in a country much greater than expected in the past is entirely to be expected and it is in itself not unwelcome. It is a step on the path towards the emergence of a single human race which will not be divided by perhaps unnecessary bonds of nationality. That however is not in any sense to endorse the policies of mass immigration as they have been pursued in Western countries. It is always a question of who comes in. Now there are many people, some of them sitting in this room, who in my view are absolutely welcome. There are many people and you'll see them as you walk around London, or New York, or Brussels, or Paris, or Berlin, and you look at them and think, how on earth did they get in? What are they doing here? We do seem to have, we do seem to have a policy of adverse selection for immigrants. We seem to welcome those people who are least likely to contribute anything to the host nations. And that has given the whole idea of immigration a very bad name. And we need to have a rational debate over what kind of, what, what kind of free movement. I don't think any of us suggests shutting the doors and having blood tests before anyone is allowed in. Perhaps there are some people here who think that's a good idea, but I'm not one of them. But mass immigration, as it has been seen in my country since the 1950s, is something which has not, for the most part, contributed in any positive sense to our national life. And that is very much to be regretted. Why has it happened? Some people are stupid, some people are malevolent, some people see financial interest, some people see the building of a stronger electoral base. There is no overall conspiracy. It, it is just a combination of deplorable interests and stupidities. But it has brought us to where we are at the moment. And to try to suppress that debate and to call people who do not like these changes far-right thugs is, shall we say, not perhaps the best response. I mean, obviously the welfare state draws people in. We know, for instance, that there was massive amount of immigration to the United States during the 19th century. But if you look at the numbers of people who left the United States again because they went there with great hopes, I will become rich and so forth, found out that no way, they didn't get rich. So they returned to their home countries. There was almost as many people leaving the country 
in the United States as people entering the United States at a time when obviously no welfare state existed and no incentive to come to a place where you don't have to contribute anything, uh, you will be housed, you will be uh, treated in, in medical hospitals, uh, you get heat, he, he, heating support and child support and all the rest of it. Um, so if none of the welfare state would exist, the flow of immigration would look entirely different from what it currently does with welfare states being uh, built up to ever higher levels. Yeah, I would add, uh, I think this gentleman in the back had his hand up, but I would add that, uh, you know, the Brian Kaplan's of the world argue that in, in pre-war Vienna, Mises could take a train to London and disembark and never have to show a passport along the way. And, you know, when it comes to uh, right-wingers complaining about the Mexican border in the U.S. and people from all over the world, not just Central and South America, but other parts of the world who come up through Central and South America streaming over the border, well, you know, gee whiz, amongst those millions of illegals might be the next Mises. You know, and it, it, they never say it might be the next Hitler. It's always just the next Mises. And, and, you know, we all just know that this is laughably untrue. And when Mises took the train, he wasn't going there to bomb the place, right? He was a businessman. You know what else? He went home when he was done with his business. So come do your business. Welcome, you know, buy your Tiki Tac New York souvenir and then go home. As, as a the Mises family b built the railroad from Lemberg to to Vienna, and it was an, it was initially a private uh, railroad, and it was then taken over by uh, by the state. And uh, the um, I think was it the the, the bro no, I think the brother of Mises was. No, I think the, the the father of Mises was a railroad engineer. Um, so obviously um, there was, <laughs> people could not uh, travel for long distances without any difficulties to begin with. Yes, in Europe you could more or less travel without ever showing your passport. I think only the Ottoman Empire insisted that you had to have some sort of uh, some sort of documents, but given the fact that we have air, airplanes and uh, expressways and all the rest of it, uh, people from the furthest end of the world can come to the other end of the world, that has changed the entire uh, uh, scenario dras drastically. Otherwise, if people know I have to, this is 10,000 km kilometers to go to, from one place to another, uh, that is an, uh, a natural hindrance to migration. All of that doesn't exist anymore because of technological advances. Um, hello. Uh, it's my first time here. If I, before I ask the, um, my question to Professor Hopper, I hope I can make little remarks about this subject. I share the surprise with my Belgian friend. Um, you, you attend here to an economics conference and migration is the big subject which is not so not so a direct kind of uh, thing and uh, but i believe that's the case because it's it's the dominating threat to our civilization uh, in europe and um, the mass media the mainstream media uh, want to make us believe that uh, migration is a human right and that everything is fine and we have to do and to do this and allow all this um, i think there are two kinds of immigration you have migration on small numbers scientists go from one university to another via borders um, small numbers uh, countries need migration but i think uh, a million million wise illegal mass immigration organized by countries into a place 
will lead only to the destruction of the existing society. There has no has not been any example in history where that was not the case. And I think this common fear is somehow shared everywhere and concerns every, everything. Um, I have not given so much thought to the idea of um, open borders and Mr. Dice, but my liberal understanding would say open borders are not the problem. I wouldn't even say migration is not a problem. The problem is that you there's too much migration that, that the society can integrate people and form this homogeneous society that you basically need for a state to function. Um, now, my question to Professor Hoppe is, I agree with you that um, for the powerful people, it's good that they destroy homogeneous uh, communities because the biggest critic, the resistance against the state comes from individuals, it comes from families, it comes from communities, and of course it's much easier to rule these people if you create chaos, if you um, make them fight with each other. Um, my question is, what's the gain for these people? I mean, they end up in a Europe of full of chaos, regional civil wars, destroying economic value. I mean, what's, why would they do this? I mean, they, they, they're also interested in stability of their power and, of course, in financial interests. But why would they destroy a country, uh, continent, Professor Hobbe? I think we are basically all of the same, same opinion. Uh, it is perfectly normal that there is migration going on. That has been going on as long as mankind exists. Um, what you want normally is people who, yeah, who, who make the country better off. Uh, when you em em employ a person in your personal household, uh, you, you want a person that improves the value of your household. The same sort of thing is, applies to the state. Um, one argument that is always done is that the state can't do anything right. So would they be able to handle the in, or regulate the immigration in a sensible way? No, I doubt that they will make it in a sensible way. But there again, the solution is, of course, to decentralize this decision, who comes in. Yes, if it is a central state, you have a bigger problem than if they would say, oh, it's Bavaria that can do it, or it is Baden-Württemberg that does it, or whatever, Saxony that regulates it. And even better, if uh, Town X does it, and Town Y does it, and t Town Z does it, and they can expel people, uh, either let them in or say, no, we don't want you to decentralize the decision, the decision making. And again, what I said before, that they allow all of this thing taking place is because the powers, the elites, have the interest of centralizing the power. Why do we have the European Union? What do we see the European Union doing? The European Union becomes more and more powerful, taking away decision-making from the smaller units, which in this ca case are the national states. Um, but the national states in the 19th century took these powers away from villages, from provinces, and so forth. Um, we cannot rely on the state ever doing anything reasonable. On only public opinion can force them to a certain extent to give in uh, to the desire of people wanting to live only with people or in the neighborhood with people that somehow are considered to be good neighbors, nice neighbors, uh, people who contribute something to the con community and avoid people who destroy the community. And what we have, what you see in Europe is going on. I mean, they said initially, indeed, oh, there will be thousands of great engineers coming out of Africa. I have not seen a single one. 
a g g great engineer coming. There is no Mises coming. I haven't seen any of them. Um, and it, you, you, you can pray as, as long as, as you want. There must be some, uh, some selection of, of people and, and, and that, that requires that you discriminate. You know some people come from such and such a country, even though I do not know that particular individual, the likelihood that he will not contribute, but that he will be a burden on society is higher. So for those societies, you have to screen more carefully. Then you know, if a German goes to Switzerland, okay, they are somehow similar. You have to do a little bit of screening too. I think the Swiss should definitely do more screening there too. Lots of idiot Germans go to Switzerland also, uh, and, and, vice, and vice versa. Um, but, if, but, but if you know that you come from Nigeria or Belgium or Congo, uh, and you know these, these places, you might want to take these in too on an in, in, on individual basis, but the screening has to be more careful. You say most of the people in those places are idiots, so they are not all people idiots, but most of them are. So more careful screening is necessary before you make the decision. Yes, this guy can come, and this guy cannot come. I have an observation and a question for Dr. Hoppe on Argentina. Uh, you briefly mentioned that uh, the peso was still legal tender. I, I believe the, the point you are making still stands because uh, indeed the Argentinian tax authorities uh, still demand uh, taxes to be paid in pesos. But uh, if I'm not mistaken, one of the things that Millet did get passed in his uh, omnibus law was uh, effectively abolishing the concept of legal tender uh, in, uh, in the private sector. Um, so right now in Argentina, if we um, make a contract where I need to pay you an ounce of gold uh, every, every month, there's no court that can uh, force you to accept pesos or anything else if you want the gold. Um, now, uh, Millet has uh, famously justified this uh, promoting the idea of uh, currency competition and the idea that multiple currencies would be used, um, which I think is one of the most, in most interesting things he's done, even though it also further shows that he hasn't properly uh, studied your work because you've uh, made a very convincing case for why uh, competition between monies is uh, antithetical to the very purpose of money. But my question is, uh, do you think that it's uh, likely or, or even feasible uh, for Argentinians to uh, go and adopt uh, a somewhat of a hard money standard um, dis despite needing to pay taxes in pesos still? Well, one of the points with, uh, let's say, some kind of dollarization is that, <clears throat> as I showed, the uh, international reserves in, in foreign currency uh, are relatively small. And when they had some kind of dollar standard uh, uh, before, uh, it, it ruined the country because the peso was back to the dollar, and the dollar rose, uh, uh, the currency strengthened against the Europeans and against other Latin American countries, and so the exports of Argentina collapsed. Uh, the, the, I remember the, the trade uh, dispersion of Argentina is more or less one-third uh, to Europe one-third Latin America and some part of the rest of the world, and one-third uh, to the U.S. So when you pick the currency, it does not uh, reflect uh, your trade uh, portfolio, and this is a serious problem. Well, but I would agree, uh, and it is happening, actually. I mean, that, that you don't need to agree, it, it just do not forbid it. Uh, right now, uh, particularly in Argentina, I was told and heard and, and observed, there are not a few Bitcoin holders because they invested in Bitcoin 
uh, very early on knowing about the bad situation of the currency. Likewise, uh, for example, in Brazil, we also have many Bitcoin enthusiasts, very on, who invested very, very early on in, in this alternative money. And uh, as was mentioned uh, various times already here, uh, dollars has have been circulating in Argentina for quite a long time. Uh, when I was there, I remember you could only buy houses in foreign currency, in dollars, basically. So uh, it is partially already dollarized, you, and one does not need to make it of officially. And, well, we have some kind of uh, uh, currency competition yeah, in, in the Hayekian sense, and... Uh, I think maybe some innovation may 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 occur uh, because the problem with Bitcoin is it's a good store of the currency, but it's not so useful as a medium of exchange. And so uh, there could be a mixture of gold and uh, Bitcoin and uh, facilitating it uh, this mechanism as an ex exchange system. So I think uh, I I'm pretty sure that the president uh, would not uh, explicitly prohibit uh, new kinds of innovation in this area. And it's a call to the entrepreneurs to startups to do something very inventive, something maybe we have not yet thought about, that would be really uh, a thing. And I think uh, the, the, that, that Miley would be tolerant, different from, let's say, other countries where it would be sanctioned right away. So uh, I see some kind of, of prospect. And uh, as I know the scene, more or less, in, in, in Latin America, uh, it's my impression that, especially there, they, they are well advanced in all these new technologies, blockchain technology, startups, things, especially within the currency area. And maybe we are in for some fantastic surprises, which would be already a super thing to happen in our sense, in our, uh, for our ideas. Uh, I raised this question uh, just for the uh, in intellectual discussion because the example I'm going to quote, uh, I don't think it will happen again. So uh, I'm a child uh, of an uh, um, immigrant uh, from China, mainland China to Hong Kong. Uh, at that time in the 1960s, at least starting from 1960 to uh, 1980s, uh, uh, the British Hong Kong government uh, adopted um, a, a immigration policy, which is pretty much an open border. Uh, it's called a touch-based system. So uh, my father, uh, who literally swam uh, from mainland China to Hong Kong, and uh, wh why it was why was it called touch-based? Because uh, well, you had to cross the border uh, of China, but you have to get into Hong Kong to, for example, like downtown, fifth, the Fifth Avenue, and, and then you you are safe. Uh, you you uh, yeah you, yeah you touch the base and you will be given the residency. And at that time, like you had to be strong, you had to be lucky, uh, not to be eaten by sharks. And, uh, and uh, when you reached Hong Kong, uh, while well, you may be given a loaf of bread, but that's it. Uh, the day after you get out, getting your residency, you need to work immediately. Uh, there was no welfare whatsoever. So my question is, is open border possible without uh, the welfare state. Uh, of course, I know in reality now the situation is you, if you cannot abolish the welfare state, then uh, yeah, because I think it's impossible now to get rid of it. But without, I'm um, just for intellectual discussion, without 
the welfare state, is open border uh, immigration possible or beneficial uh, to, you know, uh, nation states? Thank you. That, that's a good example, I think. You hear me? That's a good example you're, you're uh, telling us here. I would think quite clearly this example shows that open border only functions without welfare state. Because that, that is the consequence, may, may be quite dangerous, you know, this, this, um, this, this travel you're mentioning of your father or grandfather, wow. your father uh, going to Hong Kong, and then he, he, he got this, this, this permit and then he had to go to work. Then he had to contribute something. Uh, maybe that's, that's not that easy, I can imagine, but then you really have to do something. And I think this is a, a good criterion for people. Um, their, their need to go there is, of course, balanced against what they risk and what they have to contribute in order to survive. And if, if they, not, not only if they are lucky, but if they are hardworking and, and, and polite and everything like that, then they, they will, um, they will um, contribute something. And then migration cannot become a social problem, problem in, a, in a bigger range. So open, order, or open border only without welfare state. And once you have a welfare state, which is a first mistake, of course, then you have to close the, order, the, the borders, would be my answer. Well, I would frame it differently. If, if free migration is a natural right, if open borders is a principle, then it doesn't change with circumstances or time. It doesn't matter if there's a welfare state. If something's a right, it's a right. That's why my argument is it's not a right. It's not a principle. If you have truly open, homesteadable land, USA 1600, there were maybe five to 10, they actually prefer the term Indian, but Native Americans in 1600 in, in what we now call North America. I, so I would argue that was free and open to homesteading in a Rothbardian sense, in a Lockean sense in 1600, because five or 10 million people can't occupy, can't claim any title to the in enormity of North America. So fast forward to today, there's no conceivable sense in which Seattle, as I, my example, can be homestead, or Hong Kong, <laughs> I, I, right? So even without a welfare state, even without the bad inducements, I think whether you can enter a place depends on property. And who owns it is something we have to figure out. And whether that's an imperfect determination because you know, you have the state of Nevada and the USA, so something like 80% of it's owned by the federal government. O okay, so that's a problem. Uh, but nonetheless, we can figure out a rightful owner as best we can rather than a titled owner, and all determinations go from there. So welfare state or not, I don't think you have a right to free migration. I perfectly agree with what you just, uh, just said. Uh, Peter, you would be welcome everywhere okay so having said having said that uh, welfare st if welfare state no longer existing would reduce the significant the grandiosity and greatness of this problem yes but of course some people discriminate on other grounds too so I, I don't I don't like this person uh, even even if this person works, even if this person contributes something. No, but I don't want him as my neighbor. I don't want him as my employee. I don't like his face or whatever it is, or he said something stupid that I don't, that is a reason enough for me not to want to have him there. So in principle, what Jeff just said is right. There is, there is no right to go to a place that is already occupied by somebody unless this person agrees and says, yes, you can come, and he can discriminate as much as he wants. And 
There are many people who work, but, <laughs> but I can't stand their presence. Um, so uh, it, is, it is not just the welfare state, but the welfare state contributes to the problem. <clears throat> this question is for Professor Dr. Hoppe. You said that Millet should destroy the Fed, not pay the IMF debt, uh, cancel all taxes, stop dancing with the U.S. hegemony and Netanyahu. Um, but that would make him the nail that sticks out. And the U.S. hegemony has more than enough power to be the hammer that hammers it down. Uh, be it through any of their evil stratagems, be it assassination or like a bogus war with Argentina. Um, through this martyrdom, uh, that would end his tenure early and perhaps limit the amount of good that he is able to bring to Argentina. Foreseeing this, perhaps his compromising uh, strategy is part of his vision to maximize the expected value of the total good he can bring to Argentina during his tenure. So, in the Hoppian way of uncompromisingly um, condemning his uh, actions, does that mean that from a Hoppian perspective, we are putting the process of being uncompromising over perhaps maximizing maybe short-term results, or does that mean that the um, uncompromising way always has a higher expected value? And if you were president of Argentina, how would you handle the risks and the intense adversity uh, created by those strong actions that I suppose you would take? And, I mean, or would you resign? I'm, 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 from the outset, I have to say that I was not, I'm not quite sure if I did understand acoustically what, what your question is. It, it concerns how they deal with the IMF well, what is your concern? The light has to be green. All right, it's back. Um, yeah, it's just um, since you're condemning uh, his actions as being compromising and not being truly anarcho-libertarian, uh, um, that must be that there is a better way and that you suggest that he should have done what he said uh, to, you know, uh, stop the shutdown of uh, the federal bank of uh, the, the central bank of um, Argentina and things like that, and that he didn't go all the way, and that he added new taxes and taxation is theft. We know that. Um, so, and he's dancing with, with the U.S. All these things uh, they seem suboptimal from a libertarian perspective, truly libertarian. Um, so you're suggesting that he should have done a different action, but what I'm suggesting is that maybe riding on Philip Bagus's uh, benefit of doubt for Millet, that he's doing this to avert or lower the risk that he's going to get stopped in his tracks uh, so that he can have a longer tenure, maybe uh, do stuff on a, on a longer uh, scale. Look, Argentina defaulted on their debt already several times, and the, the result was never that the United States occupied Argentina. Um, so I'm not sure that that result would have been different this time. If you said, look, these are not regular contracts. I mean, he doesn't understand libertarian theory in this regard. He thinks this, these are legitimate contracts. Um, but this is a contract where you just force your own population to pay back debt that they didn't incur. Um, so, from a theoretical point of view, what he is doing is completely wrong. It is immoral what he does. Uh, he must repudiate. Now, I do not know what the reaction of the United States would be if he simply says, I will not pay debts, the debts that I have to the United States and foreign debtors, I will not pay that back. I do not know. But, again, Argentina did default several times. And I do not, I'm not aware of the fact that the Americans send 
uh, sent their army in or threw bombs on Buenos Aires or anything like in retaliation uh, against this, this type of policy. So my first attempt would have been, if I were in his position, say, hey, you guys, you were stupid enough to trust the Argentine government um, that you will be repaid, but I realize that those were not legitimate contracts, and I will, first of all, say, no, I'm not going to pay a penny to you, and then you can see what they will do. So maybe they then, then say, okay, the, the tanks are rolling, uh, the fighter jets will fly over Argentina. So then he can say, okay, then maybe given this situation, I'll do it a little bit different. But it, that situation didn't emerge. So are you saying that um, he could be doing more and doing all that uh, we, we've been talking about that that would be optimal and face no resistance uh, or, or, or nothing that like, no, or do you I'm, think he's not doing everything he could no, be doing? No, of course. It's, it, of, of except, course except those I, I, he can't do everything right away. I, did, I, I, ag I agree with that. But many things he didn't even try. Look, I'm not familiar with the legal situation in Argentina. Uh, I asked somebody who I trust that has better not knowledge than I have on, about Argentina, did he need, for instance, permission from the parliament uh, to close the central bank? And they said, yeah, he probably would need it, but he didn't even make an attempt to say, I close it and then see what resistance would come up against such a decision. So sometimes you, you cannot do everything straight away, but you can try and see what is the reaction of the opposing forces, and then adjust your own policy to it. But he didn't try that. He could have shut down the central bank with one decision, and then see what does the parliament say. Maybe they, maybe he could get away with it. Um, given, given the fact that the general population, again, I'm not an Argentinian expert, but given that the Argentinian population is certainly not in favor of the central bank and the central bankers, because after all, they are responsible for all the mess that exists there, and Millet himself has explained to the Argentinian population that central bank is evil, uh, it is some sort of fraud that is committed to the own population. Given that he has that, said that to his own population, the population might have been on his side. He said, okay, we close it down, but the population in this guy, this situation was less important for making his decisions, the decision that he made not to touch the central bank, then the central banking, the old central bankers that are his, his friends and his uh, main, main uh, appointees to various positions. Yes, of course, that all the central bankers that are now working for him would be against cutting down or closing the central bank. That could be predicted. Of course, Caputo and Sturzenegger and all these people that they don't want to close the central bank is perfectly understandable. They are the gangsters that run this show. Um, but Millet, and actually that is what, what, what uh, Philip emphasized of, as one of, the, um, one of the good things that Millet did, he did yeah, explain to the population the evil of the central bank. If they have any understanding of the, if his arguments would have been powerful enough to have lots of people behind this argument, then he might have easily gotten through with a decision like this, despite the fact that Caputo and Sturzenegger and whatever their names are would have loved to keep the central bank and love to keep the central bank until the world ends. So, 
Yes, you must make compromises sometimes, but you first have to test out how far you can go. Last question. Last question. A question to Jean Gap. Um, if there would be a revolution in Britain, what kind of outcome could you imagine? A very clear, short question, which does not allow any kind of clear, short answer. The problem with revolutions is that the people who begin revolutions are hardly ever the people who end them. And a revolution is always a work in progress until it's finished. I shouldn't think many of the people who stormed the Bastille in July 1789 had any understanding of what the next 10 years would bring, ending in, in, ending in Napoleon Bonaparte's uh, dictatorship. So if you're asking me what a revolution in England would do, I can't say. It might be a very peaceful readjustment of the existing order of things. It might turn into something very nasty. It is impossible to say. I think it was Macaulay who in the 19th century observed that a revolution is usually proportionate in its violence and its fury to the degree of oppression before the revolution. Now, now, since the British state is a nasty institution, a fraudulent institution, an institution which plainly does not pay regard to the interests of the majority of people in Britain, there, a revolution well, might be rather sharp, but you see the British state does not put people in concentration camps, it doesn't shoot them out of hand. It also doesn't starve us, so we all have to turn out in the fields to eat grass. So, I don't know. I, I rather hope that if we do have a revolution, it'll be something that you see on television, but which doesn't really affect your daily life. But that's my wishes. But I don't know what would happen. I don't even know if there will be a revolution. I don't even know if I hope there'll be a revolution. <laughs> So stop with revolution, we will go and have dinner and uh, forget about revolutions and anything and drink. Uh. <laughs>